in the last class we have been discussing about this time response and I will just quickly go through this. Okay. So, uh, as I said it is a prerequisite uh, for our stability analysis uh, and in the last class we spoke about this uh, timing behavior. right? So, uh, we looked into first order as well as second order system and uh, with respect to the system poles and zeros and we worked with S spline to study the behavior of our time response for a step input. right? So, in today's class we will focus on this frequency response, but before I do that I, I again want to uh, see like what things we have done in the last class. So, as I said for a step response uh, generally the output is composed of two components one is the transient or the natural uh, response the other one is the steady state or the forced response. right? And later on we took uh, a kind of uh, a first order system having a single pole and we analyzed that the output will be always having a kind of exponential graph which looks something like this. right? And later on we decompose this output as something like forced response which is nothing but 1 here and the other one which is an exponential term which decays over a time. right? So, this is known as a natural response. Okay. And uh, later followed by this we, we looked into uh, something uh, a system having a single pole and a single 0 and uh, later on based on this particular example we found uh, certain relations. Okay. So, what are the relations that we found uh, based on this? Who is responsible for the uh, force response and who is responsible for the, uh, the poles of the poles of the system or the poles from the uh, Yeah. Poles from the? No, no, no. I, I just want about the force response. Who is responsible for the uh, force response? Input. Okay. So basically, the input pole is the one that is responsible for the uh, force response or steady state response. Whereas when I look for the natural response, uh, it is the pole from my uh, system that is responsible for this natural response. Okay. So eventually, uh, what happens is like this natural response would. Uh, certainly decays when you have the poles in the left half, left half of the S plane. Okay. So, this is the summary that we had. Okay. So, basically the poles of the input is responsible for the generation of the steady state and the poles of the transfer function is responsible for the uh, transient or the natural response. Okay. And then uh, later regarding the amplitude we made an uh, argument stating that the poles of both the system as well as uh, the, uh, the input okay, as well as the zeros or responsible for generating the amplitudes of both force as well as the natural response. Okay. So, this is the final summary that we, we had, but before I jump to a frequency response I again want to re revise certain things. Okay. So, what about this uh, factor here this minus a that comes out of this? Uh, we call this as a kind of exponential frequency. Okay. So, as far as first order system is concerned uh, we have a single parameter which is minus a or exponential frequency is a term that uh, that hangs around us. Okay. So, using this exponential frequency what we can do is like we can define two timing parameters. Okay. One is the uh, rise time the other one is nothing but the settling time. Okay. I will not go much in detail because we will not do problems based on that, but in general for a first order system there is an important parameter and that important parameter is nothing but the exponential frequency and based on this we can define two parameters two timing parameters. Okay. So, similarly uh, when we went for a uh, second order system we had uh, two different parameters. Okay. For a first order system we had only one parameter, whereas in the second order system we had two parameters. What are those parameters? Uh, so, one is omega n which is nothing but the natural frequency the other one is nothing but the damping factor. Okay. So, the, these are the two parameters that we had. Now, when can I get this kind of uh, output for a second order system? Uh, uh, what type of pole arrangement that I need to have such that I end up having some kind of uh, oscillation and then that oscillation gets decayed out. So, the poles when they are real will will we get this kind of graph? Huh? Uh, the basically whenever the poles are complex conjugate then we will have both oscillation as well as a decaying. Okay. If it is purely imaginary what happens is like I will have only the oscillations. Okay. If I have purely real then I will not have any kind of oscillation the only thing is like so the graph would go something like this. Okay. It is only the exponential part that I will have. Okay. Whereas, when the poles are complex conjugate then we will have uh, this kind of oscillatory behavior 
followed by this there is a kind of uh, decaying behavior okay so this is the way by which it decays out okay now as i said based on this factor zeta or the damping ratio as well as this omega n i can define four timing characteristics okay so one of them is nothing but the trans, uh, rise time the other one is the settling time and apart from that we also have something known as uh, peak time and peak overshoot okay so peak time is nothing but it's the time at which i have the maximum amplitude okay and uh, and the peak overshoot is is the amount of overshoot from the nominal value okay so and now out of this four the third and the fourth one basically happens whenever we speak about this underdamped condition okay that is whenever the poles are complex conjugate only then these two parameters will come into picture otherwise we will not have this kind of picture at all is that is clear yeah so uh, this is just a quick revision so whenever there is an uh, imaginary part we will have an oscillation whenever the poles are complex conjugate then oscillatory followed by a decaying and then whenever it's a real or when the poles are real and equal then we'll have this kind of response and when the poles are purely real but not equal then we will have much slow variation at the output okay so now the one question that i just want to ask is like which among these uh, uh, pole locations you you would prefer for a system to be much more responsive like the moment i turn on the switch i don't want this bulb to turn on after a day right so we just want an immediate uh, output so which type of poles you would uh, generally prefer when you go for a design real and equal uh, probably when when i look into this graph uh, what happens is like the real and equal again is bit slower okay so i i i will reach to the final steady state in these ranges okay so uh, i think you could able to see right so it is not as good actually i want to turn on immediately like once a missile comes in yeah yeah but there are certain uh, as a uh, tolerance value that will be given in general okay so as you could able to see that the poles when they are complex conjugate then i could able to reach to the final steady state or, or i could able to reach to the final state that is to the value of 1 when the poles are complex conjugate okay but again the decision of which value of complex con conjugate is required is based on the tolerance value of the peaking okay you don't want the peaking to happen often or to peak overshoot okay so so in general the poles when they are complex conjugate they will have a faster response but again you cannot have a much omega value there is the imaginary part supposed to be bit smaller if it is much larger then oscillatory behavior would dominant your uh, exponential decaying factor okay so what happens is like there will be obviously some sort of uh, tolerance value that would be given to you as a specification okay so based on the specification you can decide whether the pole supposed to have its uh, behavior something like like this or it could be somewhere something like this okay so it's all up to your design spec that you need to decide but in general the poles from the complex conjugate is preferred way to respond immediately then the poles that are uh, critically uh, damped okay okay so now frequency response is nothing but it's a uh, it's about the steady of yeah so what does this conveys to you i i just want to emphasize on this particular uh, part uh, ss nothing is nothing but the steady state okay yeah so frequency response is nothing but it's a study about the steady state response what do i really mean by it because i took a lot of time to understand what is the difference between and why do we uh, have this kind of relation it, it, that that was pretty much confusing when i was doing my uh, undergraduate okay so in case some of you might be of my nature so i just want to clarify that okay yeah so it's just the study of steady state response so what do i really mean by this and why do i uh, have this s tending to uh, j omega what happens to my sigma so a lot of questions that appears that appeared for me so probably it appears for you as well so who is responsible for the steady state response is it the system poles or the pole from the input function yeah so basically 
it is the pole from the input function that defines the frequency response, okay? Okay. And uh, again, when I say I am talking only about the steady state response, we know that the natural frequency in general will not be considered or the natural uh, response we will not consider right because we know that any of the output y of t could be split as something like the natural response plus the steady state response now when i say that i'm talking about the frequency response i'm not i'm completely neglecting this natural response and we know that this natural response is basically comes out of the poles of the system right it is not from the poles of the input and when this poles are complex conjugate or when this poles are real then what happens is like there is a kind of term that appears right e to the power sigma times the of or the real part of my uh, term times the of time okay so when i'm not discussing anything about the natural response it's obvious that my sigma value is not at all considered it's considered to be equal to 0 at all right so there is no need of considering that particular value okay and as i said the steady state response talks about the uh, poles from the input function and the poles in general will have some something like uh, there there won't be any uh, real part in it okay uh, uh, are you convinced with this particular statement okay so in general what happens is the input signal that i feed to my system when i talk about the frequency response is generally sinusoidal okay so when i say it is sinusoidal then it has a defined frequency omega and i just want to define uh, i want to vary this input signal frequency omega over a range of frequency right from dc all the way to what are the frequency that you are concerned clear so it is it is this particular omega that plugs in here which comes out of my input signal clear whereas when we spoke about this time response the input was what was the input signal it's a step input now when i consider the step input the step input the single step when you decompose in a fourier transform it it has infinite number of frequencies okay so in general i had an input signal which had infinite frequencies okay the frequencies were infinite and whereas in this case the frequency we are taking each frequency at a time like every single frequency at a time and then we try to analyze the response is that is clear so now having this as our base what we do is like we will try to uh, consider a signal which uh, i'll take a signal which is x of t which is a okay and uh, now this is a time domain signal and how will i convert this into in terms of polar uh, form i think polar is nothing but there will be a magnitude part followed by some phase relations right yeah so yeah so the same signal in terms of polar form would be something like taking the magnitude squares right and then uh, omega of t minus tan inverse of b by a is what you would have okay so in general in the polar form what we find is like there is a magnitude part and again there is a phase part okay so these two are more important so that's the reason why i'm just trying to uh, brush you up with what is known as magnitude and what is known as a phase part okay so now let me uh, have a system which is h of t where i provide an input which is x of t and i'm expecting an output which is y of t okay and as i said i'm going to consider each frequency at a single time okay so when i when i speak about omega it's a single frequency component that i'm talking okay so let me have a signal which is x of t and the output which is y of t and let me take uh, my signal that has a kind of thing and i'm going to refer the phase at the input as phi i and similarly i would get an output okay and again i will read this phase as something like phi not okay with respect to the origin 
Now, as I said, the signal has a magnitude and I labeled the signal to have a magnitude of mi and also it has a phase angle which I labeled, uh, labeled it as phi i. Is that is clear? So, this one is converted as mi and this one is converted in terms of phi i. Okay? Now, what happens if this system is an LTI system? When I try to pass uh, an input having a signal frequency, will I get an output which is double the frequency? Will I get any kind of harmonic at the output? What type of output I can expect out of an LTI system? Say for example, I have an input signal whose frequency is 1 hertz. Okay? Now, what would be the output frequency? it would be 1 hertz because when I say in an LTA system there won't be any change in the uh, frequency. Okay? So, I will still get the same 1 hertz signal, but what would change between the input and output? Yeah, so, one would be the magnitude part. right? So, so the magnitude of this one would be different from the magnitude of the input right? and also what would be what else would be different from each other like between the x of t and y of t because when I look for x of t and y of t I know that the frequency will not change, but what would change as of now we discussed is the magnitude part. What else would change between the input and output the phase right. So, even this phase phi i will not be equal to my phi naught. Now, how would I relate both these quantities? So, what I do is I will translate this particular uh, function which is uh, in terms of time domain. Okay. So, what I do is I will just take one more. Now, let me take it in terms of s domain or in terms of frequency and as I said this one rather than writing it as uh, x of omega I can write it as having a magnitude, magnitude at a particular frequency and also it has a phase at that particular frequency. Okay. And similarly, I can represent this y of omega to be okay. So, in each of these cases, the omega is same, is same. Okay. So, whether I am talking here, whether I am talking here, or whether I am talking here, the omega remains the same. The only change that happens is between the phase and the magnitude part. Okay. Now, again, I can define this h of omega as something like. Okay. So, again uh, now how will I define uh, the relation between this this m of m naught of omega how will I define that whatever relation that would that it would share basically. Yeah. So, the magnitude basically multiplies each other. So, the input magnitude multiplied by the gain of the system. Okay. So, the gain is nothing but m h is what I have written down. Okay. So, now similarly uh, I have to write it as uh, the function of omega because we know that the m h of omega in generally is not a constant if I take a practical system. So, I, I need to put this as a function of omega. Okay? Okay? The m h does not stay constant for all the range of frequency that uh, I am concerned okay? it varies. So, now how will I write this phi naught of omega? or I will just remove this angle. Okay, yeah. okay, it is phi i of omega plus yeah, because the phase angles in general would get added up. Okay. So, again I am going to consider the same signal uh, x of t with some kind of proof or derivation. Okay. So, again I consider that uh, the input signal is composed of uh, a superposition of both these signals. Okay. Now, how will I write this x of s, uh, which again I can substitute in, in the place of s I can uh, later uh, write this to be j of omega and then I can rewrite it, but how do I convert this signal into a Laplace transformed signal, because with that only I can just consider uh, what happens to my h of s when I multiply in order to get my y of s. Okay. So, in order to do so, I first of all I need to convert them into a uh, Laplace transform. Okay, uh, I am also uh, not that much good in uh, math, so 
I'll just write down the answer. The answer is something like this. Am I right? Because we know that the cos omega of t is nothing but s by s square plus omega square and the uh, sine omega of t is nothing but uh, uh, I think omega divided by uh, s square plus omega square, right? Yeah. So based on these relations, I can just write down something like this. Okay. Now the point is like, uh, how will I write this y of s term? How do I write this y of s? We we did the same even in the beginning of our uh, time time response function, right? Uh, what I did is like there was a step input and that step input was multiplied to some transfer function right so it's basically a multiplication of input function in s domain multiplied by the trans the transfer function in s domain okay now I'm just going to uh, substitute whatever I've written as Yeah. So now, in this case, do I really need to concern about this h of s? You see, I'm not trying to talk anything about this h of s when I speak about this frequency response. Why is that? Huh? Uh, yeah, uh, because frequency response is basically is a study of just the input poles, okay? And I, I don't want to concern about this uh, poles coming out of my system. Okay, so that's the reason why I'm just holding that h of s, where the h of s could be either a first order system or a second order system. But those responses would generally affect only my natural response. So, whereas in the case of frequency response, I no need to consider about what my h of s is all about. But still, that has an impact. Okay, still there is an impact that comes out of the h of s. But I will not uh, go in much in detail about how does it uh, does it, but I will directly tell you the uh, result of it. Okay. So, so this is not considered, but still the h of s term will define uh, some sort of uh, modification to the behavior of my output. Okay. So, I what I do is I can just take only the uh, steady state part, and I know that the steady state part comes only out of this uh, input thing okay so I just write it as by applying this uh, what do we call it as partial fraction method I can write it as something like so everything could be uh, written down something like this okay so whatever has been multiplied by applying this partial fraction method I can write it as summation of certain things okay now when I look here, this particular part is the one that is going to define my steady state response. Okay, so I'm going to define the steady state response alone as something like, and this one contributes only for the uh, for the natural response. Okay, so I'm not going to consider this for the analysis purpose. Clear? Okay, so now. Shall I write down the final uh, output which comes out of this y of s's? Okay. Is this is clear? You had an input signal which is x of t, and when you look at the output, and when I look for the steady state response, because by the time I uh, look for steady state response, the natural response would obviously die out, and what finally ends up is something like a magnitude part which I as I said it's a product of input magnitude to the gain of the system okay and the phase by which the output varies is again a function of the input phase plus the system phase okay there will be certainly a phase that would be added up clear so now I'll talk about this board plot now what is this board plot in the last class, you people said uh, you have already studied about it, so I just want to uh, get the answer from you. Okay, so there are, there will be two type of plots, right? One is termed as magnitude plot. The other one is known as the phase plot. Okay. And from here on, it is important because based on this only we will try to analyze all of our systems. Okay, so right from here, 
our syllabus starts. Okay. Yeah. So, in the case of a magnitude plot, what do we actually plot for the y-axis, and what do we plot for our x-axis? Okay. So, so in this case, we generally try to plot this uh, magnitude in terms of dB. Okay. And what about our x-axis? Frequency. Now, is it a completely a function of frequency alone, or it's been mapped to? Yeah. So that is more important. Okay. It's a log of this omega. Okay. And what about uh, the phase plot? Is angle. Okay. Yeah. So here in this case, I'll talk with respect to the degree or the angle. And what about the x-axis here? It's again the same log 10 of omega. Clear? Yeah. So now le let me uh, talk about the need for a Bode plot. Okay. I will talk this Bode plot need with respect to the uh, S plane. Okay. When I have an S plane, why do I need a Bode plot to analyze my system? That is what I just want to emphasize here. So in order to do so, let me take a, a non inverting DC gain and uh, an inverting DC gain. Okay. So it's a plus k and a minus k. Okay. So what I'm really telling here is there is a block that has a gain, okay, and I'm trying to apply an input signal and then I'm trying to expect an output signal. Okay. So now how do I use my S plane to denote this kind of function where I don't have any poles or something like that? Can we really use our uh, S plane to denote this function k? And if it is so, how do I do that? Is the question is clear? I have a transfer function that has a gain which is just k. Okay, there is no poles and nothing. Okay, so if that is the case, how will I represent in terms of an S plane for this block or for this transfer function? Can we have something like that? Or even for minus k, will it be possible for me to draw any kind of uh, S plane? First of all, there is no pole at all. Okay, so so there is nothing like S yes term that is sitting here or S yes term that is sitting at the bottom. Okay, so we cannot completely use this for either of these two functions. Okay, so when the when the system has a constant uh, uh, gain, then what happens is the S plane doesn't gives us any kind of information. Okay, so that is where the the Bode plot would come into picture. Okay, and this is one of the reason why we move from uh, an S plane analysis to what is known as a Bode plot analysis. Clear? I hope that I have uh, justified why you are going for a frequency response. Okay. Yeah. So now having this, let us try to plot the magnitude and the phase for uh, these two functions. Okay. So I have a non-inverting DC gain which is plus k, and how do I plot this magnitude? And as I said, it is log of omega here. And here it is in terms of dB. So how do I do that? It's a, as I said, it's a constant throughout the entire frequency. Whatever the input frequency it is, the output will have a magnitude whose value is. So how do I convert this in terms of uh, dB? Any kind of constant, 20 log of something, right? This is how I represent magnitude plot for a non-inverting DC gain. How do I plot the phase diagram? This is my phase angle. How do I plot that? Is there any phase shift between the input and output? Yeah. So if the input is, is something like this, even the output would be a magnified version of the input. That, that's it. There is no uh, phase inversion that happens between the input and output. Okay, so the phase angle is generally a zero in this case. Okay, so I could relate both these kind of stuffs with this kind of diagram. Okay, now how will I do this for this inverting function? Whatever output I would get for a magnitude. Yeah. 
So yeah, same. Just because I'm taking the modulus symbol here, it would remain the same, right? So it would be like 20 log of k, and the magnitude of both this inverting and non-inverting would remain the same. But what about the phase? How does it change? So, so this was my zero degree. Okay, there was no phase difference between the input and output in the previous case. Whereas in the case of inverting, what I know is there is a completely a phase shift. What is phase angle between this and this? Phase difference between the input and output? It's pi or 180 degree, right? So at 180 degree, I'll have this phase angle. Okay. Okay. So now let me uh, pose some uh, transfer function for you. So I have a transfer function which has a constant uh, gain, which is k. And then there was how many poles and zeros we have? Two poles and one uh, zero, right? Yeah. So how do I uh, first grab the transfer function uh, in the Bode plot? Or uh, how do I convert in terms of dB? And then later on we'll talk about the phase. Okay. Yeah. Okay. When we were talking about this S plane. We, we were using this kind of transfer function where s plus z1 or uh, s plus p1 as it is. Okay, but uh, whenever I go for a frequency response, I first of all I have to rearrange this expression in such a way that I can use it for my analysis. Okay, so the rearrangement is something like this. So I have to pull out the z1 out, and I what I needed is something like this. Okay, and similarly here I need to pull out this p1 out, so such that it appears something like this. Okay. This form is time constant form and this form is uh, pole zero form. Okay. We generally have a name for it okay? and th those are the names. And when I go for uh, a kind of frequency response, first of all I need to convert our transfer function in terms of uh, what is known as time constant form. Okay. Yeah. So now how do we uh, write the magnitude part? And how do I uh, draw the magnitude of the entire uh, Hutch office? So what is the next step that we have to do is I have to substitute this S equals to J omega. So now what happens is this transfer function would return something like So I'm just going to apply this 20 log of 10 over this entire uh, term that I've have it here. Now how will I write them? So when I take logarithm on this entire uh, thing, what happens is the multiplicative part will become addition and the division part will become subtraction, right? So what I can do is like I can write it as 20 log of 10 for the k, okay, take the magnitude of it and then for z1 again I can write it as 20 log of 10 times that of z1, okay, and then So, I've already done some uh, sort of things here. Yeah. So, let me consider the first case under consideration. So, when I try to plot the magnitude and uh, the phase, what type of output you can expect? For the magnitude plot, it would be a straight line, okay, for the entire frequencies. What about the phase? Yeah, the phase would be at zero degree, okay, and this is what has been plotted here. Okay, so it's the same type of graphs that we have ended up for H that is taken alone as a k. Okay, now similarly, this could be for for a zero. Okay, so you can also do it for uh, even for a pole. Okay, so when you have a zero at origin, how do you plot this uh, magnitude as well as the uh, the phase of it? Is just by drawing a line like this. Okay, so as you could able to see that when omega equals to one, okay, so what happens is like uh, the transfer function when you take twenty log of one would become zero, okay, and that is what is happening over here, and as you increase the frequency, the omega keeps increasing, and due to which there will be a line that has a slope of plus twenty dB per decade. Is that as clear? Was that as clear? Because 
what I, what I know is like when I have omega is 10, then 20 log of 10 is nothing but 20 dB, right? So the rate at which it passes from here to here is basically 20 dB per decade because there is a decade in my frequency axis. Clear? Now when I talk about a phase, since I have a J term, the J term introduces plus 90 degree phase angle. Okay? I, I just want you to do it for this. What about this uh, 1 by J omega? Yeah? Will the magnitude will decrease? Correct, correct. Yeah. Okay? So in this case, the graph would go in the in this direction, okay? And the phase angle would be at minus 90 degree, okay? Now here is a is a case where I have both poles and zeros, and now let us assume that my zero is sitting here, and the pole is sitting here, okay? So if I consider only my uh, zero, then what happens is like when the frequency is at low, what happens to this term? Uh, you want me to draw and show, or uh, is it okay to discuss with this? Okay, yeah. So, what happens when my omega is at low frequencies? Like, I, I'm talking about these ranges. Yeah. So, some this quantity becomes negligible. Okay. So, this will not contribute to anything, and even this will not contribute to anything. What I have is something like h equals to one. Now, when I have h equals to one, then when I take 20 log of 1 it becomes 0 and that is why I have a 0 line that appears here okay so so I think you could be able to see right so there is a kind of 0 line and after a while when this omega is exactly equals to z1 what happens to this term yeah so it is 1 plus j1 and the magnitude of it would be square root of 2 right yeah so after then what happens is like as I increase the frequency the magnitude of this one would rise up okay and the rate at which it goes up is basically to plus 20 dB per decade and this is the same that I discussed here. Okay? Now, why does this tensor function start moving like this when I have a frequency omega that is greater than this Z1? Okay. So, what happens is ultimately this 1 becomes negligible when I go for a higher frequencies okay? because this particular term would become larger and larger as I move out. And the behavior would be something like this, okay? And that's the reason why after a particular while, you will have the same similar kind of graph for this, okay? After Z1, the graph would tend to start rising at plus 20 dB per decade. Is that as clear? And for a similar reason, we can also plot this. And what happens is like when the omega term or the input frequency becomes equal to this P1, then after then, you are transfer function would start decaying at a rate of minus 20 dB per decay, okay? And this is how it reacts. So, the phase angle for both of these transfer function is being plotted here, okay? So, as you could be able to see that, I, I think I forgot to remove this minus sign. It's, it's not a ma negative sign here, okay? So, clearly, when my Z is a decade lower than my Z1, uh, when my omega is a decade lower than my Z1, I will not have any phase angle, okay? Uh, so you need to understand how this has been plotted, okay? So you will be able to see that I have this phase angle at exactly Z1 to be at plus 45 degree, okay? But when I move a decade away, it gets saturated to plus 90 degree. And when I'm lower by a decade from the Z1 frequency, then I have a phase angle which is zero degree. Okay, so I, I guess you know all this phenomena. Okay, why is it happening so? You know it or not? So how do I extract the phase angle? What, what is phase basically? Tan inverse of pi by s or imaginary part divided by real part. Oh, yeah. So that is what uh, we, we generally write, right? So what I have is like omega divided by z one divided by 1 is what I would have, right? So, when I have omega that is equal to uh, 0.1 times that of Z1, what happens to the stand inverse of, I'll just quickly write it here. So, this is what I would have, okay? And when this omega is somewhere equal to Z1, then the tan inverse of 
this one would be something like this, right? And this could be approximately equal to zero. Okay. And I also know that the tan inverse, when omega is exactly equal to z1, then what I would have is tan inverse of one, and that is equal to 45 degree. And again, when I have a frequency which is omega that is 10 times that of z1, then the ratio of this, so this is when it is equal to this quantity, then what I would have is something like tan inverse of 10. And again, this value could be approximately equal to 90 degree. And this is what has been plotted here. Okay. So, this is for a 0. Okay. And this is for a 0. But in the similar way, we can even do it for a pole. Okay. And this is what has been plotted here. Clear? No, because every pole can induce a maximum uh, phase change of just 90 degree. And this is what we have plotted here, right? So, here in this case, it is at the origin, and the maximum would be just plus 90 degree. Ah, yeah. Yeah, correct. It would be like a curvature. No, no, no. That will not happen, right? That, that is what I proved here. When my frequency is uh, is points like point 0.1 times that of z1, I will have I can approximate the phase value to be equal to zero itself. Okay, and when I when I am at uh, ten times greater than this z1, then the phase angle at which it goes is like ninety degree. Okay, so the maximum is the tan inverse of infinity. Maximum is basically ninety degree, and you cannot go beyond that, right? So anything after this hundred or thousand. I will have a maximum of just 90 degree and that is what is being plotted here.